In this portion of our World Views and Values class, we are going to look at somebody who has had an incredible amount of influence on the world in which we, we live today, both direct and indirect, and that is Rene Descartes. His, his conception of the, the world, of human beings, of body and mind, and many other things as well, has radically changed the face of philosophy from what it was in the times previous to him, in ancient and, and medieval times in the West. And although he doesn't deserve complete credit for it, because there's no one individual who does, um, he is very uh, involved in the rise of a sort of modern scientific conception of the world and the, the quest to figure out where human beings fit within that, that new, um, radically changed picture. So we're going to look at one of his easier works to, to tackle and digest, The Discourse on Method. I'll tell you why it's one of his easier works in a few minutes. Before that, I want to you know, remind you that what are we going to do in, in this introductory video? There's always three things that we look at. One of them is the genre of the work, because you want to have a good sense of what kind of work you're reading as you're plowing through it. The other is we'll talk a little bit about the historical context that Descartes is both growing up and working within and also changing. And then we will talk about some of the key themes of the work that you can expect to see tackled in the videos that follow this one. What is the genre of this particular work, The Discourse on Method? So when we think of genre, we're talking about what sort of writing we're dealing with. And why are we interested in that? Because it gives us some clues about what we ought to be looking for, what we ought to be paying attention to, what kind of expectations we can have of the author, and what expectations the author has of us as readers. Now, discourse is not a term that we use an awful lot today. When we do use it, it's often used to mean speech or just talking in general. We engaged in discourse. If you do discourse analysis, you're studying other people's conversations or perhaps your own. In philosophy and in the other humanities uh, more generally, discourse has a different meaning. And it, what it signifies is that you've got a text that is dealing with a particular subject and the author is going to try to develop a, a fairly systematic exposition of that subject. So it's meant to be something, another synonym for this would be treatise. It's a philosophical work that aims to be systematic, not necessarily exhaustive, but certainly to give you the key ideas, the key points, the key arguments, the key elements of a particular perspective. Descartes is doing a discourse on method, and we're going to talk about why method matters for him so much a little bit later. But you want to keep that in mind. The, the centerpiece of this is, I have a new method that I'm presenting to you, and, you know, there's, there's a bit of narrative at the beginning. There's actually a lot of narrative running throughout the work because he's conveying to us his own intellectual experiences. But he's not trying to say, um, I just had these, these ideas, uh, these insights, and here's the way it was for me. There's a little bit of, well, you know, it doesn't necessarily have to be the case for you. But he doesn't mean that. What he's doing is he's offering himself and the new way that he has thought things out as a model for the rest of us. And that's what this discourse is really about. So what we've got here is a mix of personal narrative and philosophical argument, pretty important and, and deep metaphysical argument, and then some discussions of physical phenomena that are not that interesting for the most part to us, like the circulation of the, the blood and the heart in part five. And we're actually not going to pay much attention to, to that. Let's talk about the narrative. What kind of story is this? So it's not a story of, you know, a romance or of a conflict between, you know, a protagonist and antagonist. It's really more of a, something like a quest. And what is the quest for? What is Descartes really motivated by in this quest? He's looking for knowledge. 
Now you might say, well, knowledge is easy to find. Just go onto Wikipedia and there you've got it. But Descartes is worried, as we ought to be in our own time for different reasons, he's worried in his time about there's all these claims to knowledge out there. Are they really knowledge or are they just opinions? Are they just things without solid foundations when we start plumbing down to the depths? And if you think about this, this is a real serious issue because anybody can provide explanations, but is the explanation a true explanation? Does it really hold up? A lot of what we have come to call science, you know, over time, if you look at it carefully, some of it turns out to be reliable, some of it ends up being pseudoscience or bunk, and we have to throw it aside. So he's dealing with this fundamental question in the beginning of the modern period and asking, how can I actually attain real knowledge? There's two other key things that are associated with this. For Descartes, to possess knowledge means to have certainty. It's not just enough to have the information. You need to be certain that that information is actually true, is actually correct, is really representing things the way they truly are. So this quest for certainty and this identification of knowledge with certainty is something that's really key to this, this narrative, to this quest that he's on. Another thing that he's looking for is a method that will allow him to build from a solid foundation on up to all sorts of other disciplines, all sorts of other sciences, to attain practical as well as theoretical results. Um, Descartes actually has this beautiful image of a tree where, um, and it's the tree of knowledge, the tree of the disciplines. There's a lot of M's involved in this. Metaphysics is the roots of the tree, and physics is the trunk, and then the branches are things like mechanics. And by mechanics, he means everything, you know, for, that we call technology, all the way to anything where you can put parts together and, and, and make it work, make it attain some sort of purpose. So engineering would be part of mechanics. What else? Medicine. And by medicine, he doesn't just understand, you know, going to the doctor or going to the hospital. He understands what we might call the entire field of public health. So diet, for example. Diet can be understood according to the Cartesian method. And then morals, or what we oftentimes call ethics. Descartes thinks that these are areas that have not been, at least up to his time, properly understood because people have had the wrong methods for approaching them. And if we begin anew and come up with a, a, a better method, we can attain all sorts of lasting, reliable results and improve human life as a result. So that's what this book is really about for him. He's presenting uh, a proposal to us about how we ought to think, how we ought to approach matters, how we ought to think about the entire world, how we ought to think about ourselves, how we ought to think about our relation to whatever happens to be transcendent to us. Um, this, this book is also what we can call a retrospective and a summary of his philosophy up to that point. Now, that doesn't mean that it's the last book that he wrote. As a matter of fact, it's not. <clears throat> but a lot of the key ideas that we're going to see in his other works show up in a summary form and get placed in a kind of context within the discourse. So what I need to tell you about here actually strays a little bit into the historical context part. Descartes had a book that he was working on called The World, and he didn't end up publishing it. And I'll tell you why in, in a few minutes. He did end up publishing three portions of it. The Meteors, which was about you know, meteorological phenomena, the Dioptrix, and the Geometry. And this discourse on method was meant to be a preface or an introduction to these three works, essentially of what we would now call um, physics or, or applied natural science, except for the geometry, of course, right? And 
in it, Descartes is presenting his ideas to a general audience. Interestingly, this is the one work that he's going to, at that point in, in his career, write in French. Because Descartes, although he's a Frenchman, like everybody else who's educated at the time, knows Latin. And so he writes most of his works in Latin, and then they're translated into French. Not by him, by the way, but by, by other people. This book he writes in French. And why does he write it in French? Because he wants to reach a general audience, which even, as he says, includes women. It's, it's important to remember that women did not enjoy the same sort of equality uh, that they enjoy today, uh, in, in you know the field of education or the professions or any of those sorts of things, it, uh, th that wasn't the case back then. So Descartes is writing this in French because he can't assume that most women are going to have the kind of education that um, his other books would presume before they're translated, but he wants to reach women. And it's an interesting thing. That why does he want to do that? Because he considers them, essentially, to be on the same level as as men. So this is a, a like we said, a, a retrospective and summary of his, his philosophy. Um, it's good to think about this in context of some of his other works. So what would some of those other works be? He, by this time he had already written a book called The Rules for the Direction of the Mind, published in Latin. Um, he's about to bring out his Meditations on First Philosophy, in which you're going to see a lot of the same themes as in the discourse dealt with, but in a longer, more detailed, in some ways deeper, um, and, and providing more argument sort of form. He will also write a Principles of Philosophy later on that's, that's intended to be a textbook, um, pretty tough textbook if you read it. And then finally, towards the end of his life, he writes a book called The Passions of the Soul, where he's trying to explain the mind-body interaction. Uh, he wrote a lot of letters in his lifetime as well. Uh, if you want to study Descartes further, it's very useful to look at some of that correspondence. As a matter of fact, you know, there's, there's a correspondence with Princess Elizabeth that ties directly to the Passions of the Soul and to many of his other works that uh, is very illuminating. But as far as this work goes, the, the discourse, um, what you've got here is a fairly short, concise work discussing his philosophy in its general terms. Um, as far as this class goes, here's the last thing that I want to say about genre. As far as this class goes, I think it's very important that you read parts one through four very carefully. A good portion of, of part five you can skip over because he's concerned there with explaining some of his, his, his ideas about mechanics and medicine, and it's not stuff that's particularly interesting or, or, or relevant to us today, except where he gets to talking about minds and machines and animals towards the end of part five. And then part six, you can read it or, or not. I'm not actually going to discuss it much in these videos because it's not uh, especially important as far as Descartes' philosophy goes. He's sort of showing applications, and he's also discussing something that fits in with the historical context, which is the uh, Galileo incident. So that is the, the, enough about the genre of the work. Let's think now about the historical context in which Descartes is living and thinking and writing. And it is a, an incredibly heady time that he is, is working in. Very, very interesting. That's why I, I highly recommend, you know, studying the history of, of the, these thinkers, because Descartes is not only being formed by the historical context that he's in, he's also contributing to steering it going in certain directions. And although he attempted to be as uncontroversial of a, a figure as possible, he ends up sparking all sorts of controversies and being involved in, in many of them as well. So what can we say about the historical context? If we're going to sketch things out in very broad terms, and that's really what we have to do uh, in, in this video so that we don't get too bogged down into the details, 
One of the things that we can talk about is the intellectual life of Descartes' time. That's a good sort of lens through which to look at what's going on. And we can talk about the effects of the Renaissance and then the Reformation and the entire humanist period that, that's, that's passing through them. That had an immense influence. So what was the Renaissance? It was a rediscovery in part of ancient philosophy. You know, Stoicism had been largely underground Epicureanism, a lot of these texts are now coming to light, being translated. People are, are engaging in, in new ways of trying to think about matter, about physical phenomenon, about the human body, about society. And they're departing from the, the older traditions, which by that time would be um, not only you know, sort of what we can call a, a Platonist or Augustinian tradition, um, you know, which was very deeply influential within, within the Catholic Church, which had a, an immense role within European society, but also Aristotelian philosophy, which by that time had come to largely dominate the educational institutions of the universities and even, you know, what we could call nowadays preparatory schools that were places where you would go to get an education so that then you could go further on to the universities. What we've got going on is a number of new initiatives where people are, on the one hand, trying to take these old, older models of philosophy from antiquity, some of them developed further in, in the Middle Ages, and see whether they can make sense of the world in which they're living. So that includes the world, physical phenomenon, ideas about God, ideas about the heavens, ideas about the human being, and ideas about society. So Descartes is at the, the center of this. You can see a profound influence on his philosophy coming from Stoicism. You can also see influences on him coming from Augustine, coming from other figures. And you can see him reacting very strongly against what had become the sort of party line of Aristotelian philosophy. By the way, here's a side note. Um, the Aristotelianism of the late Middle Ages was not particularly good or faithful Aristotle. It's not as if they were really approaching things in an Aristotelian way. The late scholasticism had become rather moribund, and um, you know that's why the word scholastic uh, has become kind of a byword, a pejorative term. So you say somebody's work is very scholastic, you mean that they're doing nitpicky um, distinctions that don't really matter much. They're engaged in a lot of... Uh, Thomas Hobbes said, jangling with words rather than attending to things. So Descartes is in part reacting against that. If we mix into that something else that, that was going on at the same time, things get even more complicated, and that's the Reformation. The Protestant Reformation shook Europe to its very core. And not only in the world of, you know, say, religion or how we should do things in church or what church we ought to go to, but also in the world of literature, history, philosophy, all these things set, set shockwaves through that. And even further into the world of politics and everyday life. So, you know, for example, Descartes is going to grow up in a part of France which, although he's a Catholic, is, is actually dominated uh, by, by Protestants at that time. And he's going to end up going to a Jesuit, so it's Catholic school. Uh, the Jesuits were always a little suspect, though. They were either like too conservative or too radical for most of the other Catholics. So there's all these amazing things going on, all these interesting divisions. And these people wrote and thought and talked to each other. For these people, religious ideas mattered. They really uh, thought that it was important whether one focused on you know, just scripture alone or attended to tradition, whether one thought that there were two sacraments or whether there weren't really any sacraments at all, just observances or, or ordinances, or whether there were seven sacraments. These were the sorts of things that people really thought uh, one ought to give a lot of thought to. At the same time, there was also a movement towards 
uh, what we call free thinking or libertinism or atheism going on. There were people who were deists. Descartes was probably one of them who thought that God gets everything started and then sort of says hands off and, and leaves things up to us human beings to figure out so that we don't need religious institutions. So there's a lot of ferment going on in intellectual life and a lot of sort of like hold the line doctrinaire stultification. And Descartes is very clearly on the side of innovation uh, and against the just keep doing things the way that they've been done sort of party line. At the same time, Descartes is also not somebody who wants to change things just for the sake of changing them. His project is to try to figure out how we could put an end to all this bickering and arguing and debating by attaining some sort of basis of certainty that we could, you know, say, if we want to be very crude, look, all of you just shut up. Here's where we have to start from. Quit arguing with each other. Learn the basis, and then let's build together a brand new society. Uh, another thing that's going on at the time that's coinciding with all of this is the rise of what we call modern science. And there was a lot of experimentation going on, a lot of theorizing about the nature of reality, about the nature of material objects and their processes, physics, the, the science of, of change or motion. Um, chemistry was beginning to develop at that time. There were a lot of biological ideas that were you know, beginning to float around, although they were not doing all that much experimentation. Descartes actually did, did things like that. Um, they, they were beginning to know a lot more about the human body and its workings because they were doing things like dissecting cadavers and, and looking to see what's actually in this, this thing. So Descartes himself is learning the best science available at his time. He's also a major contributor to the developing sciences, particularly mathematics. If you've ever heard of Cartesian coordinates or analytic geometry, Descartes is the guy who, who synthesized the ideas that were required for that to happen. If you've ever taken a calculus class, Descartes didn't come up with calculus. That was Leibniz and Newton later on, independently of each other, by the way. But Descartes laid the groundwork that made it possible for these further advances in, in geometry and arithmetic and mathematics as, as a whole to occur. He's very interested in the nature of the body and how it connects with, with the mind. And when we look at his science, we might say, well, a lot of that's pretty unbelievable given what we know now. But that's how science advances. People come up with new theories, new ideas, test them out, and they, they try to come up with the best account at the possible at the time. And, you know, eventually it gets, if, if it's not sufficient, replaced by better accounts. But those better accounts use the earlier accounts as their sort of staging grounds for making advances. And Descartes is deeply in, involved in that. Um, so he's involved in intellectual life. He's involved in science. Um, one of the things that we do have to mention that, that, that really had a major influence on Descartes' career is the Galileo incident. And I'm not going to go into any great detail about this other than to say that, um, you know, it's not so simple as, well, the church just came down on Galileo and they were so mean and, and you know, bigoted and, and close-minded. Galileo did a lot of pushing on his own part, if you, if you actually read about what took place. And not all, not all Catholics thought that condemning Galileo was a good idea. As a matter of fact, Blaise Pascal, one of Descartes' contemporaries, said, Really bad idea, guys. This is not what you ought to be doing. Be it as it may, um, Galileo advances some new theories about um, the nature of the universe, about, about the, the way things are. So he's advancing a new worldview. And Descartes, to a large extent, shares that worldview. As a matter of fact, while Galileo is starting to run into problems with authorities and going through all these things that are going to lead to his house arrest, um, Descartes is working on a book called The World, and it's supposed to be a system that explains all the physical phenomenon, as far as he knows, within the world. When Galileo gets condemned, Descartes says, oh, 
I better back off from this sort of thing. What can I salvage from this project? And that's where these, these three treatises that the Discourse on Method is an introduction to uh, are going to come out. So the world itself doesn't get published, um, not in its entirety until, until much, much later. And Descartes is seeing this as sort of a sign that I'd better make sure that I stay out of trouble. So you'll see a lot of professions on Descartes' part that he's a faithful Catholic, that he's not going against church doctrine, that as a matter of fact, this philosophy is going to be better for church doctrine than Aristotle or Thomas Aquinas or any of these sort of people. And a lot of that, most scholars think, is kind of, you know, CYA or window dressing. You know what CIA, CYA stands for, I think. Um, really, when it comes down to it, Descartes is interested in advancing a new way of looking at at the world, at the body, at the mind, um, and he will do whatever he needs to do to adapt himself to the situation that he's in, which includes one in which religious persecution is an option. Um, he does go to live, for the most part, in, in a country, in a Protestant country, but a Protestant country in which free thinking is allowed um, the, the Netherlands. He spends a lot of his adult life there after being a mercenary soldier in the wars of religion, by the way, where he doesn't actually see much action. Towards the very end of his life, he ends up moving to Sweden. Uh, he's, he's invited to give, give tutorials to, to the Queen of Sweden. They don't go particularly well. He's not there for a long time before he gets sick and, and dies. Uh, but in the meantime, he's developed this incredible new philosophical system, this new philosophical approach to things. And he ends up having an immense influence both on those who would be called Cartesians, those who are following in his footsteps and trying to um, work out that kind of philosophy, which would include people like Benedict Spinoza or Nicholas Malbranche or Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz. Um, but he also influences those who argue against him, who take all other positions that, that he um, doesn't think are right, but they think are right, because he's seen as somebody who you have to grapple with, somebody who you have to address. That, that's one way you can tell that somebody's made a very big impact, that when people want to propose something else, they have to say, that's why this guy over here is wrong and why I'm, I'm right. So that's the historical context for this work. What are the key themes of this great work, The Discourse on Method? If we look at them, we're going to see that many of these are not only key themes of that particular work, they're key themes of Descartes' philosophy as a whole. And probably the one that we ought to begin with is Descartes' most famous saying, the thing that if people only remember one thing about this guy, it's this, which is, I think, therefore I am. And there's really two important sort of sub-points to that. One is that this is the Archimedean point, as Descartes calls it, that allows him to move everything else. This is the one thing that he says we cannot doubt at all, uh, because in the very act of doubting it, it's clear to us that this is the case. The other thing is, it, it, it points out to us, I think. I am a thinking substance. That is the nature of what it is to be a human being for Descartes, to be a thing that thinks. Um, what else can we talk about? Well, another key theme of this here is of carrying out a kind of review of the education, of the sciences, of the disciplines, of all the claimants to knowledge of his time, putting them into the balance and seeing whether they really measure up, whether they can deliver the results that correspond to their promises. So that's another key theme. Um, another major one is that if we want to attain certainty, what we have to do is blaze a new path that begins with us, that begins with turning inward to our own minds, not paying attention to what people in the past have said and just following in their footsteps, but for once in, in our existence, actually stopping and saying, what do I know? What can I come up with? How are things for me? And we would call that sort of a return to inwardness or subjectivity. Uh, another super important theme is this notion that if we want to make progress, 
we need some sort of method. And if we have a, a good method, then we will be able to figure out everything that matters. So this reliance on, on method in, in philosophy is very Cartesian. Um, one of the key elements of that method is that it includes what we call hyperbolic or methodological doubt. That is, saying that if we can doubt something, that we're going to reject it, that we're going to be skeptical about it, that we're not going to accept it just on the basis of you know, verisimilitude or somebody else's say so, or the fact that people have done that. And, and we're going to extend this doubt really far to, to the point where we can say, perhaps this is all a dream. Or if I can't figure out how, how this is different than a dream, I'd better reject not only my dreams, but my waking reality as well. Uh, another key theme would be the reliance on this criterion of clear and distinct ideas as the touchstone for whether something is true, whether we have genuine knowledge, whether we can rely upon it. Another important theme, one that is, is probably um, up there with the most central themes of Descartes' philosophy, is a very strong distinction between body on the one hand and mind on the other, what we call a dualism of, of body and mind. The difficulty then is to figure out how they actually intersect and interact, uh, and we won't get an awful lot of this in, in uh, the discourse, although he talks about that in other works, but we are going to focus a lot on the distinction between body and, and mind. Um, there's also some important discussion about God, you can probably say that Descartes was, was a deist. He's not really a, a religious believer in, in the way that a lot of people are today. Um, he's more focused on God as a metaphysical principle. And we're going to see how that matters in his philosophy and how that fits in. Um, the emphasis on sort of neo-Stoic, that is, that is Stoic but, but understood through a different lens, uh, ideas in morality is also distinctively Cartesian. And the last theme that I want to hit on is there are some important implications about the differences between human beings who have minds on the one hand and machines and animals on the other hand for Descartes, which do not possess minds. So these are all the, the big picture themes that are running through this work. And we're going to look at quite a few of these in the videos to come.